Hello and welcome to the Computational Biology in Gene Regulation by Heterozygotes. Also welcome to my terrible audio quality. So, how do we measure the levels at which genes are turned on and off and use this to compare health in diseased individuals? That's our question. So, to start with, let's talk about the basics of gene regulation to begin with. Um, so, gene regulation is the process of turning genes on and off. Some genes in a genome are expressed at certain times, while others aren't. Uh, and because of gene regulation, two people could have very similar genes, but one of them could seem perfectly fine and healthy, and the other one could, like, look like they're dying, for example. Uh, so, there are different, like, for di different types of genes get regulated differently. So, for example, there are things called housekeeping genes, which are expressed in almost every cell and therefore pretty much always turned on. Uh, there are tissue-specific genes, and they're only expressed in specific cells, like a liver cell or a red blood cell. And they have these things called transcription factors, which we will talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then there are factors expressed in these tissues that can turn genes on and off. Um, that's transcription factors. Um, but so some genes are regulated during development. So like when you're young, you could have cer like certain genes would be turned on. And then when you grow into an adult, like those genes could like gradually get turned off uh, or vice versa. And anyway, and so like how, why, when is this used? Uh, so um, gene regulation is used to like help cells like like be different from each other so that's the reason why we have like nerve cells and fat cells and cartilage cells things like that and uh they their um gene regulation can like be caused by changes in the environment or signals from other cells it is important to make to make for making like proteins that are necessary for certain tasks at certain times and it can, because it has like, like gene regulation turns genes on and off and affects how what genes are expressed, it's pretty important for health. So it can, it can influence that a lot. Now, basically the very basics of how it works are that, um, so the, the cell will get signals from either the environment or other cells around it. Um, or what well, we won't get signals from the environment, but anyway. But, and then these things called transcription factors, which are proteins that bind to certain regions of the gene and control how much DNA gets transcribed. Uh, so they, yeah, those control how much DNA gets transcribed to RNA. And then transcription factors bind to regulatory sequences in DNA called enhancer and promoter sequences. And you might be asking, what are those? Well, I'll tell you. So basically, promoter sequences are these little, um, so... They're like around this uh, binding site. Oh, blah, let me start starting. So they are located where around where the gene starts to get transcribed, and they're a binding site for RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that initiates transcription. And you couldn't have guessed, they're responsible for initializing transcription. Then we have enhancer sequences, which are short sequences that it, um, that sort of influence how, like how genes get transcribed. They they influence transcription. And by increasing promoter activity, and they um, can enhance or suppress certain genes uh, and whether they get expressed. And they can be located pretty much anywhere around where the genes going to be transcribed. Um, are getting transcribed. So now more about gene regulation. Oh my goodness, so much. But um, so basically, transcription factors can form complexes. Uh, to start, stimulate, or repress transcription of related genes. Uh, so yeah, back to transcription. You couldn't have guessed. Uh, so genes that are turned on are copied into mRNA, and then they and then that allows them to be like detected by the cell and read. Uh, and then those, then those proteins can get made or whatever the heck they're gonna do. So gene regulation can also be tracked by looking at proteins within the cell instead of just mRNA, which is cool. So DNA methylation, another process very important to gene regulation. Uh, so it occurs when this thing called methyl is added to DNA, and it modifies the gene's function and expression. Or, but 
that's bad wording but <laughs> anyway uh so <laughs> Meth so these methyl groups will bind to DNA around promoter sequences and then inhibit the transcription of those genes because they're kind of crunking up the, the process. And then DNA methyltransferases, quite a mouthful, control the addition of methyl groups. So methyl groups can also be taken away from DNA in a process called DNA demethylation. Very creative name there. So there's... Now we're going to talk a little bit about these things called mRNA, dsRNA, you see the title. So mRNA, or microRNA, is complementary with mRNA, and it inhibits the translation of, um, the protein translation of target mRNA. So, and this is mainly in animal cells, but, like, sometimes it happens in plant cells. Sometimes. <laughs> Not often, though. And then there's this also this RNA called dicer, which silences genes by dicing up the microRNA target transcripts. And then there's dsRNAs or double-stranded RNAs that activate small RNA-induced uh, induced gene activation or RNA-A, very different <laughs> names, by targeting gene promoters. Then there's siRNAs, known as like a billion different names, like one of them silencing RNAs, but that's not really the official name. But anyway, <laughs> doesn't really matter. It's just siRNAs. And they turn genes on and off, um, or they turn genes off. They don't turn them on. They ignore me. Uh, after transcription, by cutting off the mRNA molecules coding the genes. Woo! So now that we've talked about, like, how gene regulation works, let's, let's see how we can measure gene expression. Because, you know, that's pretty important to what we're looking at. So there's this thing called RNA-seq. This is one way of measuring gene expression. And we have this beautiful graph on the right. It's not graph, but like it, it makes things very simple and I like it. But um, yeah, so um, the first thing that happens is reverse transcriptase creates complementary DNA or cDNA fragments from the RNA. And then these fragments, uh, you put adapters on one or both ends of the fragments, depending on how much money you're willing to spend. And you'll see why this is important in literally the next step. Uh, yeah. So then you have to sequence each molecule to get short sequences. And this is only from the ends with adapters. So that's why you'd want two instead of one, but you know, that's kind of expensive. So, and this can, the sequencing can be done with like literally any high throughput sequencing tech. Uh, high throughput sequencing tech is just, tech that has, uses a large amount of computing power over a long amount of time. Uh, so yeah, that's what that means. Fancy word, not, not so fancy meaning. Means. And then after you do that, you can assemble them, or try to assemble them as best as you can. And you can assemble them with like genome references or transcript references or just do it de novo. Um, and then after that happens, you you have the ability to like create a map that shows both structure and expression of genes. Uh, very cool that you can see both. <laughs> and then you have the um. Then that oh yeah. And then after that happens, you classify reads as exonic, junction, or polyate. So exonic reads are reads from exons. Junction reads are reads from like between exons. So it's like where they would connect. Yeah, back to polyate reads are just the reads from the adapters. That's how I understand it. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the end of my section. And Anha, will you take the wheel? Northern blot and sage are both techniques that can estimate gene expression from the mRNA in a cell. Since northern blot relies on messenger RNA, it must first be isolated from the cell. Researchers use an enzyme called protease to break down the cell membrane and then separate the proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and other cellular contents from the mRNA. They also use gel electrophoresis, a technique that sends a current through a gel containing the molecules to separate the mRNA from each other. Researchers then incubate the sample with single strands of DNA or RNA that are designed to be complementary to the gene they want to test. The single strands, also called probes, contain radioactive atoms that help with identification. The probes bind to the gene of interest, and when later exposed to the X-ray film, the radioactivity makes marks on it. Intensity of the marks is directly correlated with the level of expression in the gene. 
a more intense mark will indicate that the gene is heavily expressed. However, Northern Blot can only test a few genes at a time, and it requires that the researchers know the exact sequence of the gene in question, so they can make complementary probes. SAGE, another technique, bypasses some of these restrictions. Separating the mRNA from the rest of the cell is the first step in SAGE. Researchers do this by pouring the contents of the cell over small beads with long strands of thymine on them. The thymine binds to the adenine tails of the messenger RNA, while the rest of the cell just passes over it, separating the expressed genes from the cell. Since mRNA is fragile, reverse transcription is done to make cDNA, or complementary DNA to the mRNA. The cDNA is converted to double-stranded DNA as well. Researchers then cut small parts of the DNA, called tags, at designated positions of each gene. Two tags represent and identify each gene. All the tags are then joined together into a long concatenator for ease of processing. For reliable results and more reads, the concatenators are placed in bacteria so they can get copied multiple times, and then they're read in and sequenced in a similar manner to how we built genomes. More algorithms can compile a list of tags by finding similar sections in the concatenator. The number of tags found can provide an estimate of how much the gene corresponding to the tag was expressed in the cell. Both SAGE and RNA-seq provide vast amounts of data that can be analyzed through computational biology. As I mentioned before, SAGE produces a long concatenator with many tags which need to be identified and counted. The tags can be identified using BLAST to find the original gene. They can then be counted by a simple counting algorithm to calculate the frequency of mRNA. In order to analyze and assemble RNA-seq data, sequence alignment is necessary. Tools like Top Hat are also used to align sequences and find similarities. Tracking regulation is pretty important since incorrect regulation can cause a myriad of complications, as we'll see later. So Anika mentioned earlier that computational techniques are necessary to understand sequencing data, uh, like from SAGE when there's a lot of tags, and how computational techniques are also used to understand RNA-seq data. Uh, however, beyond understanding sequencing data, computational techniques can be applied directly to gene expression data, so like gene expression profiles of certain cells, to better un understand it. So currently, we're actually lacking an understanding of transcription factors. We've identified about 2,000 in humans, but only really understand 500 or so. Um, but we have the capabilities to produce large amounts of data, so we can do a lot of computational analysis at this point. Uh, one term to know is gene regulatory networks, abbreviated as GRNs. Uh, these are collections of DNA segments that work together um, in conjunction to have an effect on expression. So GRNs can be represented as networks in computer science, with nodes being different genes, uh, edges being the interactions between these genes, and um, at the end of the day, the output being uh, expression levels. So eukaryotes have really complicated, uh, complex uh, regulatory networks, unlike prokaryotes like E. coli, which use really simple regulatory systems like black operon. Uh, eukaryotes have transcription factors, uh, as Alex described earlier, that build like scaffolds and recruit each other and bind to different parts of the DNA, fold it into a uh, confirmation. Um, so it's useful to have use computational techniques to try and better understand these complicated systems. Transcription factor binding sites are places on the genome or on the DNA directly where transcription factors bind, and um, we can look for these sites in the sequences itself. Um, and there's been a lot of computational algorithms developed to identify these sites. Uh, for example, the GRAM algorithm detects cis regulatory modules, which contain um, promoter motifs that are repeated. And comparative genomics between 
uh, comparing the genomes of different individuals or even different species can be used to identify common themes. So as I mentioned earlier, comparative, uh, comparative studies of genomes of different organisms are important. So as we know, there's so using computational techniques to try and study them would also be useful. Uh, so now that I've given sort of a broad background on computational biology and gene expression, let's look at uh, a specific case study, uh, case of ischemic stroke. So stroke is a condition, a condition caused by disrupted blood flow to the brain, which can shut down bodily function and brain function. Ischemic stroke specifically is caused by a blood clot. It's the most common type, uh, whereas hemorrhagic stroke is caused by bursting of small blood vessels. So we identified two papers, Jai et al. and Ju et al. Uh, they both identified key proteins, and the second paper focuses on sex-dependent differences between males and females. So let's dive into Jai et al. first. There's been pre previous research suggesting influence of genetics and stroke, so these researchers decided to dive deeper into it and use computational techniques to do it. Some background, peripheral blood mononuclear cells are cells that are often found after a stroke in the, in the brain region. So they're probably very important. So previous research, previous research has been done to identify the gene expression profile of these cells. And they've been uploaded to this database, the Gene Expression Omnibus, with this specific tag. So, First, Jai et al. using, they downloaded all the data from this database and they used pre-processing and bioinformatics to find 144 DEGs or differentially expressed genes. So these are genes that were expressed differently in stroke patients and non-stroke patients, uh, expressed significantly differently. So they found some that were upregulated and some that are downregulated. So with this in mind, with this information in hand, they use the search tool for the retrieval of interacting genes, which is a database, to construct a protein-protein interaction network. This network uh, represents nodes as, they represent biological molecules, most likely proteins as nodes, and edges as interactions between these different proteins. So one protein might upregulate another protein, or it might downregulate another protein, uh, or gene, or something like that. So here is an image of their gene regulatory network. Uh, you can see that for some of the nodes, there are a lot of edges going into and out of, and some there are very few. So some of the proteins only interact with one or two other proteins, while as you can see in the middle with the red nodes, they interact with a lot. So this, this becomes important later. They actually use this property to identify key genes. So nodes with high DGs are especially noteworthy because they interact with a lot of other proteins and are interacted with, uh, interacted by a lot of other proteins as well. So in this specific study, they identified EGR1, June B, and ATF3, among others, uh, as key genes. So actually, when they first, just going by the high degree, they discovered maybe between, I'd say, 8 to 10 different genes. Uh, but they want to narrow this down to the most important genes and try and discern their function. So they use the Kyoto Encyclopedia for Genes and Genomes, also known as KEG, which is a database, and the Database for Annotated Visualization and Integrated Discovery Algorithm, David Algorithm, to perform enrichment analysis, which helps them to discern the biological significance of their identified key genes. So they, know, so they can find out what these genes actually do in the body and how they're important specifically, rather than just knowing that they interact with a lot of other genes. So the results of this, they identified a few key genes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will name a few of the most important ones. ATF3 is uh, can play multiple roles in cell response, in wound healing, and it was found in this study to be upregulated in brain ischemia patients. So based on this knowledge from the KEG database, uh, this prior knowledge about the ATF3 and its function, uh, it's hypothesized that it might have a protective effect against stroke. It, on the opposite side, TP53 is a predictor for poor prognosis, so higher levels of TP53 are associated with a bad prognosis 
for stroke. There are a bunch of other genes, but we don't have the time to go through all of them. Uh, but the main point to note here is that they were able to identify a few key genes that could be the focus for future research um, to help develop um, help develop therapies for stroke. As a result of gene regulation can cause disease. The first one we will be looking at is a study by Dr. Stephen J. Luby and his team from the Institute of Cancer Research in the United Kingdom on colorectal cancer. The research found that significantly increased expression of the BMP4 protein pertained to a significant association with colorectal ca cancer risk. BMP4, or bone morphogenetic protein 4, is a polypeptide that is used in bone and cartilage development. The team conducted their research by using data from a sample containing previous cases of colorectal cancer as well as control. The data collected was analyzed using various assays. Computational methods included software to conduct software sequence reads, such as the mutation surveyor software, and other systems for sequence detection, and software for an analysis on allele-specific expression and haplotype. Their team found a result of a specific element mapping to a gene as a transcriptional enhancer, which caused the increased expression of BMP4, leading to colorectal cancer. The next example is a study by a team from the University of Strasbourg in France. The team investigated enhancer RNA, or eRNA, a long class of non-coding RNAs transcribed from active enhancers and their association with Huntington, Huntington's disease, a neurodegenerative disease resulting in the progressive degeneration of neurons in the brain. They conducted their study on mouse striatum using genome-wide scale approaches and conducted analysis using previously generated RNA-seq and chip-seq data. Computational analysis methods include software for analysis of PCR, gene regression, eRNA identification, and various alignment algorithms. The research found that eRNA was deregulated in mice that had Huntington's disease when compared to control mice. The research also found that the decreased eRNA expression resulted in downregulation of associated genes, as well as the loss of a significant number of RNA polymerase II binding sites. These are just a few examples of how gene regulation and abnormal expression can cause disease. Abnormal gene regulation has also been linked to various cancers, autoimmunity, neurological development, de developmental disorders, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So to summarize, we've looked at an overview of what gene regulation is and where it's used, some processes to measure and analyze, analyze the expression, the application of computational biology to, the, to these analyses, as well as various studies showing the effects of abnormal regulation and the computational analyses behind the studies. This is a quick look at the sources that we used for our presentation, and thank you for listening today.